Okay, then um, Stefan, thanks for the moderation and good morning, good afternoon, everything in between. And welcome to my talk on domain storytelling. And um, yeah, here it is, good morning. Um, and storytelling, I would like to start with a little story. And where is the story best told? Of course, around a campfire. So please gather with me around this virtual campfire here and think about um, our ancestors, a group of cavemen sitting in the midst of the winter around their campfire in their cave. Outside it's cold, the wind is howling, the snow is snowing, but inside it's warm and comfy around the campfire. Everybody's happy about that. But to be honest, it's also a bit boring. So everybody is happy when one of the hunters gets up and tells the other members of the tribe how it used to be in the summer when he and the other hunters of the tribe went after the mighty bison, tracked it down, finally found it and then killed it with their spears. And after he has finished, there's a little silence. And in that silence, the tribe members hear a scratch and they turn their heads to the wall where they heard the scratch and they see a picture was painted there with coal and animal blood by one of the other members of the tribe. And what's interesting, we can still see this picture 16,000 years later today. And this is a picture from the cave of Altamira in Spain. And yeah, 16,000 years later, it's still about the same things. We still want to spark a fire, tell a story and paint a picture. And <clears throat> we are still fascinated by monoliths, although we do not understand them. <coughs> Sorry. Of course, the fire is not sparked in a dark and damp cave anymore. It's usually sparked um, in a meeting room. And we gather around, not a real fire, but around a whiteboard or a modeling space. And the story isn't told by hunters anymore. The story is told by our users, by our domain experts. And the story um, is painted, the picture is painted not with animal blood and coal anymore. It's painted with markers on a whiteboard. And here you can see Stefan um, doing a modeling session with domain storytelling. Stefan has to do the moderating today, so you will have to get along with me for the talk today. And who am I? My name is Henning Schwentner. Um, I'm the guy with the many kids. And um, I'm the author of Domain Storytelling together with Stefan and also the translator of Vaughn's book, Domain Driven Design Distilled, which is called here Domain Driven Design Compact. And there's also an upcoming book, which is called Domain Driven Transformation. Um, we will hear more about that later in the talk by Carola. I work as a coder, coach and consultant at WPS, which means if I'm lucky, I get my hands on the keyboard. Um, but actually, most of the time currently, I'm working with teams on their big piece of software, usually monolithic piece of software, legacy software, that has to be modernized, modularized. And their domain storytelling, what we look at today, um, is a good means. For me as a technical person, what's interesting is that you can build monoliths in all the platforms. So I see many different programming languages and usually we have this fight, which platform is better, .NET, Java or JVM. When it comes to building monolithic software, there's a clear use and they're all equally well suited for that. And of course, there's one language that's best fitted, that's COBOL, still crossing my path um, on several occasions. Okay, and story time again. Um, it's nice to talk about cavemen, but of course we want to build software. So let's look at a concrete problem. Let's look at a concrete story, um, a concrete domain for that we want to build software. And this story is about Bob. Bob is a victim of Dieselgate and wants to get rid of his old combustion engine car and wants a new electrical car. Bob has one problem though, there's no money in his pocket. 
he goes to the car dealer anyway and tells them the question, do I get a car for this? And of course, he's expecting an answer like, no way. There won't be a car for you. But um, he is lucky, Bob is lucky, because uh, the car dealer tells him, well, we have a solution for your problem that's called car leasing. And car leasing, well, how is that going on? Well, normally, um, when you have a customer want a car, you give a lot of money to the car manufacturer and the car manufacturer gives you a car. But if you don't have a lot of money, then you can bring the leasing company in between. And the leasing company will get a, give a lot of money to the car manufacturer. The car manufacturer will you give the car. And then you have to pay a so-called monthly installment, make a monthly payment to the leasing company. And I think we can all well imagine that there is um, a monolithic legacy software in place, which is obviously called MonoLease. And we will learn um, splitting the monolith. Uh, we will learn about that later. Um, I will skip about this in my talk, in the talk by Carola, and I assume in many of the other talks um, of the authors that are gathered here, we will hear about that again. So, to build software for this car leasing company or to modernize this existing um, software monolith, it's important that we have to understand what's happening in their domain. So, we want to move on from thinking about technology to thinking about the business. That's the task for us developers, being technical people. Thinking about two wheels, we have to move on to think about the dollars. And that means we have to understand what our users are doing, and that's why we are interviewing them. And, well, it starts with our customer um, who tells their wish for a car to a salesperson. Salesperson from the leasing company. The leasing company salesperson will then calculate the installment for the contract. Installment is the monthly payment. Uh, the customer will sign the contract of the salesperson if um, the customer is okay with the installment and say, well, well, yes, I can afford that. And then the salesperson will pass on the contract to the risk manager. The risk manager will check the credit rating. The credit rating is the risk of the customer. The risk manager calculates the resale value. That's the risk on the, of the car. And if the credit rating is good enough, the resale value is high enough, that means the risk is low enough, the risk manager will vote the contract. To vote means say, yes, we want to do this contract, or no, this contract has too high a risk. We cannot do that. Let's assume the risk manager says, yes, the contract is voted positively, and the risk is low enough, then the salesperson will give the car to the customer. Of course, many other steps are happening here as well, but for what I want to tell you today, this is enough. This is our first domain story that we see here. And we can already see why it's called domain storytelling, because we want our domain experts, the people that are doing the work, the people that are using the software later on, that they tell their story, the story of what they are working on. And let's have a closer look here. Let's look at domain storytelling explained. <clears throat> First of all, domain storytelling is one method or one tool out of a family of methods out of a toolbox. And this toolbox, this tool of methods, uh, this family of methods is called collaborative modeling. We have this idea of getting out, bringing the developer out of our dark basement rooms. So bringing together the developer with the domain expert, that's why it's collaborative modeling. We're not modeling on our own, building the model on our own. We are building the model together with our domain expert. That's why it's called collaborative modeling. And what we then do together is also called knowledge crunching. That's a term from DDD. The idea is we want to chew on the knowledge until the juice gets out, the assets get out. And there are several tools in this collaborative modeling family. User story mapping is something that you might have heard of. Event storming is another one, and many other methods, and then also domain storytelling. And 
Domain storytelling combines two important ingredients. One is a pictographic language. You've already seen that or got an impression of that. And then a workshop format. And let's start with the workshop format. The basic idea behind domain storytelling and in general collaborative modeling is that we want to bring together the right people and let them tell a story. And then while they tell the story, we record that story as a diagram and show this is what we have understood. Did we get you right or where's the misunderstanding that we can get rid of that? So we need the right people and we let them tell a story. Um, why storytelling? Because telling a story that's typically human, that's deeply rooted in all of us. We've seen that already our ancestors, the cavemen, they were also into telling a story, listening to a story. All of us have probably sitting on the lap of our, or sat on the lap of our grandmother hearing a fairy tale like Hansel and Gretel here. Maybe a different um, fairy tale if you're not from Germany, um, but still fairy tale stories, that's something that is deeply human. Of course, we don't, don't want to hear fairy tales, we want to hear real stories. So when it comes to the right people, it's important that we do not invite only management. It's also important that we invite people that are really doing the work. Because if we only have management, then we will end up with fairy tales. They will tell us how they want work to be done or how they did the work, how it used to be done before they got promoted 10 years ago. We want to know how the work is done today because we want to build software in the end for the people that want to use it today. So who are the right people? People that are doing the work. Who else are the right people? Of course, Chuck Norris is always the right people, but most of the time he can't make it because, well, he has to save the world or do some stuff like that. And then the right people are two groups, the storytellers and the listeners. The storytellers, those are the people with knowledge that want to share that knowledge. And the listeners, that is the people or those are the people that want to learn something, that want to learn this knowledge. Usually the storytellers are people from the domain and the listeners are people from software development or developers. But it's not as black and as white as this because when you bring together different people from different parts of the domain, then they will also learn from each other. Also, a developer that has been a long time in a domain will become a domain expert, a storyteller, for himself as well. Okay. And then we let them tell their story. And I said we not only tell the story, we also record that story. We also paint a diagram and that's because we want to get rid of these misunderstandings. And as you might know, misunderstandings between developers and domain experts <laughs> are something that can happen. So this is software development in one picture or requirements engineering in one picture. We have this we have this idea of our customer, well, I get this great thing, this great software, this flying horse, and yeah, then of course you see what they will get. So it's also about expectations management, bringing together our understanding with their understanding. And that's why we start very simple. We start very simple. Um, we start with listening to every sentence and recording every sentence um, in a graphical way. So when we hear the sales person passes on the contract to the risk manager, then we draw that sentence into our diagram. So the sales person hands over the contract to the risk manager. And if you look closely, you can see here's already the first misunderstanding. Um, our user said the salesperson passes on the contract and we record it hands over. And this is the point where our storyteller or domain expert can tell us, well, I don't hand over the contract, I pass on the contract and this is important for me. There's a small difference between these words and this is a difference in our domain and I want to, uh, I want to tell you that this is important. So these small differences, that's what you want to find out. Or maybe they tell us, well, pass on, hand over, 
those are synonyms for me, this means the same for me, then it's okay. But we want to know these small misunderstandings because these small misunderstandings, they quickly add up to the big misunderstandings which made programs fail in production, of course. So we draw these, <coughs> sorry, we draw these diagrams. And we can, oh, th th there's a slide missing here, we can build different um, sentences out of these um, out of these um, things that we hear here. So, for example, here we have two actors. Um, what we are doing here is we are actively listening. So we are using a technique that's called active listening. And active listening as opposed to passive listening. Passive listening is just sitting there and saying, yes, 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 I do understand you. And then we go apart and I said black and you understood white. The idea of active listening is that the listening person is repeating in their own words what they have understood. Or here, repeating in our own diagrams what we have understood. So we can be sure our understanding is the same by giving feedback. And we're using storytelling. We already talked about that because that's deeply human and we're not using abstract processes um, because that's something that you have to learn. That's why domain storytelling has its own notation, simple notation, and is not using UML or BPMN or another notation, um, which is usually more powerful, but also um, more complicated. So we want a simple notation, a simple pictographic language, as we call it, because we want it to be able to be explained in five minutes and then start with modeling. We don't want to send our domain experts into a training for five days, so they learn the BPMN notation, and only then we can start modeling. I said the pictographic is simple, the pictographic language is simple, <clears throat> and that's why we only have two kinds of icons and one kind of arrow. <clears throat> the two kinds of icons are the actor, those are the people that are actually doing something, and the work objects, the things, that our uh, actors are working on, doing something with. And the one kind of arrow is the activity. That is what the actor does to the work object. <clears throat> so two kinds of actor icons, actor work object, one kind of arrow, activity. And then you see, yeah, thank you very much. <clears throat> Sorry. And then you see uh, we have another element here that's the so-called sequence number and that brings the time into our story. So we can see all these, um, all these steps in a row. Okay, so what are examples for these elements that we found there, these, these building blocks? The risk manager, uh, that's an actor. The contract, that's a working object or work object. And votes, that is an activity. So we can build sentences like risk manager votes contract. Sentences are built out of these um, simple icons. And of course we can use different icons here and we usually should do that. So different work objects, different icons, like the installment here gets a dollar sign, um, the car gets the car icon. And um, the same is true also for the actors. We can have a single person or we can put a hat on their head or um, put a tie on their neck um, if that makes, that makes sense to uh, differentiate these different actors. Also groups may appear as actors and sometimes it makes sense that IT systems also appear as actors. More on that later. Um, when we draw our diagrams then there's one thing um, that might be surprising at first but when you have drawn your first couple of the main stories, then it totally makes sense. And that is that the actors usually appear only once. We have only one customer here, one customer icon, and that is the same customer, of course. And the work objects, they appear several times. So we have a step four here, the customer fills out the contract. And a step five, the customer signs the contract and can see here are two contract icons. Um, although they mean the same contract, the same piece of paper in real life. 
and we will say later, later why that makes sense to not use the same icon again and again, but to have several icons. One reason is you can imagine that, that we have otherwise would have all these arrows between two icons and nobody would understand anything anymore. So those are our building blocks and these building blocks, they are of course drawn onto some modeling space. Um, we call it usually the modeling canvas. It doesn't have to be a real canvas. Um, it can be a whiteboard, it can be a piece of paper. And um, usually we want to have a big white space where we model. It's a good idea to put the name on top and then have some space where we add the um, assumptions, preconditions, and general annotations. Okay, and with that, I would like to do a little demo. And Susanne, you were so kind um, to be my interview partner here. And please uh, come up to, to the stage. And great. Hi. So, um, dear auditorium, uh, meet Susanne. Susanne, this is, yeah, we don't know who that is. And I'm going to. Um, oh, go ahead. Okay, yeah. Come to you. That's great. <laughs> Um, and I would like to do a little modeling session with you to show this tool in action because it's nice to talk about it in theory, but well, it's nicer to see how it actually works. And um, I want you to tell me a story. Mm -hmm. So we need a story where you are a domain expert in, and mm -hmm. I assume that you've traveled by train. So let's imagine um, you've traveled from Berlin, for example, to Hamburg by train, and mm -hmm. how would that work out? Where do you want me to start? Shall I start with um, selecting or um, searching for train options? To yeah, maybe that's a good idea. Okay, so yes. um, I already hear there are train options. Yes. Um, okay, and how do you do that? I usually use an app, the okay. Deutsche Bahn uh, app. Okay. Fancy. And then I um, search for the destination of the, from the de departure to arrival from Berlin to Hamburg, for example. Okay. And select travel dates and travel times when I would okay. like to, for example, arrive in Hamburg or when I have to leave from Berlin to, okay. figure, out, to figure the train options, figure out the train options. Okay. Um, I try to model that down here so you find out uh, the train options for um, the date, the travel time and travel date mm -hmm. in the Deutsche Bahn app. Mm -hmm. And, okay, yeah, now I get a, <laughs> um, <laughs> now I should zoom in um, so everybody outside there can also read what we've seen here. And you said you, you are doing it in the Deutsche Bahn app. Mm -hmm. um, for reasons that I'm going to tell you later, Let's imagine um, there is no Deutsche Bahn app, or you don't do it in the app. How would you do it on paper? How did you do it in the old days? Oh, where, where did oh. you find out the train options and the travel date then? Oh gosh, <laughs> that I would cry that I don't have the access to the online solution. Yeah. Um, I would then um, yeah work to uh, walk to the train station maybe so as one option. Yeah. And um, I would uh, look at the train schedule. Okay and uh, figuring out what is my correct route from, okay. from uh, Berlin to Hamburg. And awesome. Then uh, so, sorry, let me add that. So I, I take this train schedule here and now you see why I did this little exercise because now we found this word train schedule and that's an important domain concept uh -huh. that probably is also hidden in the Deutsche Bahn app. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so let's uh, get now back to our steps. So you said you find out the train options for the travel date in the train schedule. Mm -hmm. And what's the next step that you're going to do? Uh, then I am uh, yeah, planning my my departure. So I'm still at home, right? And okay. So um, if I have this, the online train schedule, um, then I am um, yeah, leaving home and then uh, going to the train station. Okay. And then? Um, finding out the platform. Okay. For my uh, select train. Oh, by the way, yeah. Okay. 
So there's some step ahead, Depend, depending if we are going to do it online or offline. So okay. also buying a ticket ah. for that selected. Okay. Trying that. Okay, and who do you buy that ticket from? From a ticket machine, one okay. option. Okay, and other my, options? From my um, online, from my app, using my app. Mm -hmm. Or in the old days? Um, the ticket machine and the train station. Okay. And then I take the ticket machine and I also add um, a note, an alternative online. You said online um, or an app, right? Yeah, so it's um, either, yeah. Okay, I'm going to the meta level. We are seeing um, a speciality of, of domain stories here and that's that they are scenario based, we call it. So we are telling one scenario, one story, not several stories. So that's why I put the alternatives down as a note, but we are telling the one scenario where you buy it at the ticket machine. Okay, so now you bought the ticket from the ticket machine and then you go to the platform mm -hmm. and then? I'm waiting for um, the train to arrive. Okay, and then? Uh, uh, when the train arrives, I am entering the train and finding my seat if I have booked not only a mm -hmm. train uh, ticket but also I made a seat re reservation up front. Okay, enters train and um, finds seat, seat, mm -hmm. not seat, sorry. Um, okay, and you said um, for your reservation and that reservation is on the ticket or, or where do you find that? Exactly, so that is my uh, um, ticket, there is my seat reservation printed, like what car okay. and what seat number. Okay, um, so find um, seat for seat reservation um, Sorry, uh, from ticket. Let's turn these arrows around. Um, and that you're mentioning the car and the um, the seat number. Mm -hmm. um, for the sake of the exercise, since we do not have as much time, let's assume we are doing what we call a coarse-grained model, mm -hmm. and let's stay on a. Uh, not too detailed level, so that's why I leave these um, details out. Although there are, of course, interesting uh, when we uh, want to build software later. And that's also a typical thing that domain stories that we start cause grained and then later move on to a more fine grained level and then would, would look into these details again. Okay, so now you found your seat and then? I sit down. You sit down, okay, and then? Um, then I'm traveling to Hamburg from Berlin. So okay. the, uh, the train leaves. I am reading some books from the okay. signature series, for example. Yeah, a very good um, point. Yeah. Uh, then <laughs> I arrive in Hamburg. Okay. I, yeah. So you arrive in Hamburg, mm -hmm. and um, should I write down here Hamburg, or is there another word for destination? Destination. Okay. Maybe that's. Uh, arrives at the destination. Or destination and train station. Might be a train. Uh huh. Good point. Um, uh, destination and train station. Um, and in between, you read the books. Um, I forgot that. Um, <laughs> very important. Very important step, at least for today. Um, and um, <clears throat> is that it on a coarse grained level, or are we missing something? You said the train is leaving. Yeah. Um, in, in time. In, in time, okay. Special case. <laughs> and um, who is making the train leave? Um, is there another actor that we might be missing in the story here? We're yeah. making so that is a, a, the train uh, service staff, uh, like the train train conductor. Okay. Uh, then the platform staff uh, s sending signals to. Okay. For for leaving. Um, ah, okay, okay. I see you have a lot of domain knowledge there. No, not at all. That's what I <laughs> observed so far. Okay. 
Okay, so let's for, on, on the coarse grain level, maybe let's stand with the uh, coil, uh, with the train conductor and let's say um, the train conductor drives the train mm -hmm. um, with yeah with who um, what what who are you in this story? What's your role? I am how do you call it passenger. Passenger. Is that okay. The right word. I don't know. Um, I don't know the, the native speakers. What would you say, yeah, passenger? Yeah. Um, okay, fine. So uh, I'm zooming out a bit, so we can step through or through the story. So um, it starts with our passenger who finds out train options for travel date and time in the train schedule, and then the passenger goes to the train station. The passenger goes to the platform. The passenger buys a ticket from the ticket machine. Or no, that's the wrong. That's the wrong way. I think you said you buy that the ticket first, right? Mm -hmm. So, you you buy the ticket from the ticket machine, or alternatively online or in an app. Then you go to the platform. You wait for the train. The passenger enters the train, finds the seat for seat reservation from the ticket, and then arrives at the destination train station. Reads some books. Um, the train container uh, conductor drives the train with the passenger. Okay, there's again a problem with the numbering, right? I think this should be number eight. You, the train conductor drives the train, um, then you read the book, and then you arrive at the train station. Mm -hmm. sounds okay. Good. Sounds good to me. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, and see you again later. Yes, see you. <laughs> okay, so um, this was Domain Storytelling in Action. You've already seen some more of the interesting details, and that is um, that we have this scenario-based modeling, and um, I switch to the slides for that again. And that is the scenario-based modeling. So usually domain stories um, do not come alone, but we have several domain stories because we're looking at different scenarios. For example, we start with typically the happy path, car leasing the happy path. We looked at that. Suzanne and I, we looked at um, traveling by train the happy path. And then we look at in uh, in interesting special cases like what's happening in car leasing when the customer can't afford the installment. That's another story. Then maybe he has to bring some other guy in um, who um, takes the risk. Or car leasing, the contract is too risky. Then um, we do something else. That's one reason why we have different scenarios, um, why we have different domain stories, why we're doing scenario-based modeling. And another um, is what we call scope. Um, the scope is made up of several factors, the granularity, the point in time, and the domain purity. And the granularity, um, that's something that we looked at. We start usually with fine grain, uh, with coarse grain stories, and then we move on to fine grain. Okay, point in time, domain purity, we do not have the time to talk about that in detail today. Um, so I'm going to jump to the conclusion, if I find it in my slide deck. Um, Somewhere to the right, um, and <clears throat> yeah, for the conclusion, if you, I got you interested in this method in domain storytelling, then you might want to look in some further reading. And um, there's, as a first, go to the domain storytelling homepage. That's domainstorytelling.org. Then there is, of course, the reference um, on the method, the book by Stefan and me, and. Um, Usually I say best you buy it from my website because then I get a cut from Amazon. Um, but today it's probably the best thing to buy it um, from the um, Pearson website because then you get the promotional code and get it a bit cheaper. Okay, if you want to look into our um, detailed uh, project where I use domain storytelling to build some real software, then look into Leasing Ninja IO, and with that the end is near. Usually, I would say there is some swag here, stickies, in the online situation that's hard to do. Um, so I just say thank you, happy end. That's it. And Stefan, back to you.
Thank you very much, Henning. We have time for one question. And Ioannis asked, how would you organize domain storytelling workshops online? Okay, so um, before the pandemic, um, most people in the collaborative modeling community said, well, one of the most important thing about collaborative modeling is bringing people together so we can see each other, see if we can smell each other and see if it works out with that together, see body language and so on. And then we all had to learn. Um, now that the pandemic is over, um, we have two options, do it in real life, do it online. If doing it in real life um, is an option, is a possibility, I would still um, prefer that. Having said that, um, it's no problem to do it online, um, even with different continents and different time zones. I've done this many times and it, it worked out. What you need is the right tooling. So you can use a tool like I was using here. This tool is called egan.io, which is a special tool for domain stories. Um, and then it's also interesting to have a tool like Miro or another virtual whiteboard where you can put the results on where you can a draw and model together on the other side. And then it's also important that you have um, a good video solution where everybody has a good connection uh, and everybody can turn on their video. Because um, we are in uh, discussions, we want to look each other into at least the virtual eyes and be able to tell us also things that uh, where we have a different opinion um, and there it's important to see each other because then we have at least a little bit body language at least um, the minutes there. Okay, thank you.